Welcome to Scale Forum 98, Britain's premier 4mm fine scale model railway exhibition. Once again, the Scale 4 Society has assembled a marvellous collection of layouts that represent the very best of 4mm scale railway modelling. An exhibition of this size takes many months of careful planning to stage. To show you some of the preparations, let's go back some 12 hours when the hall looked rather different. On Friday afternoon, exhibitors from all parts of the country began to arrive at the Leatherhead Leisure Centre. The complex task of reassembling and testing layouts can take several hours to complete. By the following morning, a minor miracle has taken place. 11 layouts and over 50 trade stands are ready for the show to open to the public at 10.30 sharp. Before we begin our grand tour around the layouts, Mike Peascod, Chairman of the Society, outlines the show's aims and that of the Scale 4 Society. Uh, the Scale 4 Society has been going for somewhere about 23 years. Um, it came about because we felt the need for an association to bring together people of like minds so that um, they could work together and perhaps benefit from each other's expertise and um, collective knowledge. Uh, the society has grown from strength to strength and from very small numbers we've managed to achieve somewhere about 2,000 members. Um, and the intention is to consolidate that 2,000 members in the year 2000 so that we can say we have 2,000 members in the year 2000. SCO Forum started from the very early days of the Society's existence. It was a venue for members to meet and to discuss common problems. We invited along uh, layouts and demonstrators as well as the trade and together they formed the nucleus of what is today Skull Forum. Um, we have developed in certain areas because we've managed to add little bits and pieces to uh, the event. We have various cup competitions. Um, we have the Deputy Chairman's Cup competition which is uh, eagerly fought over each year. Uh, uh, the Chairman's Cup competition does allow the members to display their uh, skills in modelling and again these cups are fiercely fought over but as far as SCO Forum is concerned in general terms the development is taking place year upon year. This year we've had the addition of the help desk which is a first for us and that allows our members to have a focal point for answering questions about the society, about modelling skills and about the exhibition generally. We hope to add uh, new developments every, year, every few years so that the exhibition is fresh and lively and living and advancing. And we have plans for next year, even though as I speak this show is not yet closed, um, we are planning for next year and next year will feature layouts based on a particular decade in the last century. As well as the layout that will be built in the halls over the weekend, we hope to invite 
a speculative layout of what railways will be like in the first decade of the coming century. We hope that this will represent a vibrant and forward-looking view um, and I would recommend that people should get here next year so that they can see the results of this project. We begin our tour around Scale Forum 98 at Great Bardfield in rural Essex. Great Bardfield is a fictitious station based on a proposed extension to the Colne Valley and Halstead Railway. David Hawkins, a member of the South Hants Model Railway Club, is our guide. This is the second time I've exhibited Great Bardfield at Scale Forum. It's probably um, about as near to being finished as a layout can be now, I think, and it's time to move on to another one. Basically, what I've tried to do is um, create an illusion of um, atmosphere, depth, uh, nostalgia, I suppose, Essex in the 1950s. Um, people often ask me about how do I get depth and all the rest of it in. I'm, I can't pretend a lot of it was actually deliberate, although in retrospect I can see some of the little tricks I've managed to play, unconsciously I suppose. Um, a lot of the things that seem to work are having, for example, there are four road endings on this layout but you can't actually see any of them and that, I think that gives the illusion that the layout goes on beyond the baseboard edge. Um, I've tried to come up with a, a consistent and sort of coherent model where everything is more or less of the same standard, where I've tried to um, not only do the railway side but the non-railway side, in particular the road vehicles of which I have a particular interest. So you'll see that there is um, an Eastern National bus. Um, those that know will know that it's Eastern National because it has a silver radiator. It's got the right fleet name, the right number. It's actually a real route that ran through Great Barfield. In fact, some people may be aware that um, the bus was built first and the layout was built around it. Um, basically, I didn't want to go through all the effort of changing the destination blind, so I built a layout to put it on. I'm really trying to create a scene, an atmosphere. Um, I think absolute accuracy and correctness, this may sound a bit heretical, comes secondary to um, the appearance and the what I call credibility of the layout. Um, this layout was actually built, like many others, as a prelude to building a proper layout. It's only been going now for seven years, so, and I still don't know what the proper layout is going to be. It's got a working title of Even Greater Bardfield, but uh, I'm down to six possible schemes now, so uh, don't hold your breath for the next one. But. Uh, Maybe in about the year 2005 we'll have another, another version of something like this. More mainline, bigger trains is, is what I've got in mind. Um, more um, special purpose, goods wagons, that sort of thing. Big trains, Britannias, B-17s, B-1s, War Department 280s. Um, but quite where exactly? It's going to be East Anglia, possibly Suffolk, East, the um, East Suffolk main line. Um, as far as that goes, you know, it's, um, it's still all up in the air, but, you know, I think about, I've gone about as far as I can go with this layout, and I think one of the, the tricks is to leave it alone when, it, when you think you've got it okay, so I think that's the message, really. I could add a lot more to it, but I think that would actually start detracting from it, so, you know, I, I've got to, if I want to build layouts, I've got to build another one now, and uh, the Great Barfield will be around for a while yet. From Essex, we travel west to Dartley, an imaginary West Country seaside town. Co-builder Jeff Day explains the history and development of this great Western Branch line. We evolved with the uh, Amsway Group, and we were sort of decided to build our own layer as a sideline. So, uh, and this was our main interest in that. So, uh, we decided to build one for ourselves. Um, and it's a uh... It's a fictitious layout, is that right? Yeah, it's fictitious, and that basically because the the idea being is the fact it gave us a bit more freedom to actually do what we wanted in that, without the constraints of modelling an actual uh, particular station. So that way, and that, you know, we don't have too many people coming around saying, you know, this is wrong and that is wrong. 
and the year the sort of area it's set in? Well, it's based in uh, Devon, like the North Devon coast and that, so based late 20s, early 30s, which gives us um, a full range in that of uh, rolling stock and locos, that sort of thing, and that to be able to run a good selection, really. Covers also the later period between the Great Western, so we have the early and the later series. And as time permits and that, all the stock and that will be suitable for the layout as well. At the moment, there's a few low, uh, items that shouldn't be here, but we'll, we'll let them go. <laughs> and it's a uh, seaside term, is that right? That's right, yeah, it's based on the coast and that, so uh, try and sort of incorporate some of the holiday traffic and that during the summer. And have you got any future plans for the layout? Um, it's really just a uh, level of detail and that that's uh, to bring it up to sort of um, the standard we want as we sort of see various items that we know that are missing from the layout, we'll include them as we see, uh, as we see fit. Have you had any problems over the weekend? No, just a couple of uh, solder joints on the panel and that, but apart from that, she's uh, performed fine. Uh, all the rolling stock's behaved itself, so that's the main thing. And what part do you enjoy the most, the scenery or rolling stock? Um, well, it's the building side of it that's where my main interest is. In, you know, as the, you know, I've got twice as much stock as we actually need for the layout and that, so that's where my main interest is, but uh, we've, all, we've all had a hand in all of the various items and that, so it's, they've all got their uh, good points and bad points. Some jobs and that you don't look forward to regardless. <laughs> so it's been a real joint effort? Yeah. yeah so we've all sort of uh, mucked in for one reason or another, even if it's just unloading the van. We now head north and over the border into Scotland and to Dubbyside, which is based on a busy harbour branch line. The layout has quite a history to tell, as Alan Goodwillie now explains. Dubbyside, in fact, was built a long time ago. The original section was built about 27 years ago and was to the original P4 standard before the scale 4 thing really took off. And uh, the centre section of the layout is really unchanged since that particular time. It went into the museum at Melrose during the 1980s and at that time it was a large circular layout about 25 to 30 feet long by about 10 feet across and had uh, a large station area on the other side of the layout uh, and basically a mainline railway at that time. This also worked as a, a harbour plus terminus as a sort of end-to-end -end layout and in its present guys, it has a couple of extensions on either end and we're busy adding a mainline section on behind. The idea being that uh, Wside is uh, next to a coal harbour and the port to Wside is more a goods harbour, but um, that really represents uh, the norm up in uh, Fife where uh, the layout is based because although there was a village called Wside and it did have a harbour, it didn't really turn into the major coal port, which was at Methyl. Now, Methyl is just um, a stone throw from Dubbyside, and in fact, nowadays, the two just connect together. Uh, so it's a what might have been rather than a what really was. All the buildings, in fact, are based on actual prototypes, and uh, from the Fife area, not just Methyl area, but also Kirkcaldy, Leaven, Largo, and just around the coast generally. What we're trying to do at the moment is give the impression of really quite a heavy industrial area because there was a lot of coal mining went on, lots of distilleries, steelworks uh, and so on. Although we haven't got steelworks, uh, we are hoping to include a small foundry uh, eventually as part of it. And at the moment we have a distillery, uh, we have a power station with its ash handling plant and uh, wagon tipplers and we're also going to eventually have along the back uh, seen um, the typical coal hoists that we had in the metal area. Uh, we might replace the two that we have at the moment, which are only 80 feet high, with two that will be 120 feet high, uh, which would give a better impression of what these things were really like. They were very high and used to load the ships with uh, coal, and they would bunker coal for the ships as well. There'd be lots of uh, low relief shipping as well uh, as part of the back scene. And when we get the main line running in across the back, it'll add a great deal of movement to the layout. Uh, really looking forward to this because it's something that we've 
really just been working towards in the last year or two, and it'll probably be another year yet before that's all complete. We're now back in the West Country at Mia, a small fictitious country station. North London group member Chris Longley is our guide. Yeah. Yeah, it's based on the old Somerset and Dorset section as would have appeared in about 1950 and the rationale behind this layout was uh, that a fictional line running from Wincanton to Warminster and after the Second World War the section beyond between Mere and Warminster was closed and lifted so the attempt has been made to show uh, the station as it might have appeared uh, in the very early 50s, sort of 50, 1951. Um, prior to closure, very little traffic left, virtually no passengers, uh, very quiet country branch line. Um, the stock that is uh, generally used uh, comes from uh, a layout that was built uh, Burnham on Sea some years ago, and see now. About five or six years ago, the layout was um, transferred to the North London Group, and I still continue to run it for them. Uh, so it's more of a club layout now. Uh, however, we still try and operate it reasonably authentically, but you do sometimes see guest stock appearing. As you've probably seen from the video, Sentinel Railcar, amongst others, makes fairly regular appearances. Um, that's about it. Uh, technically, it's a very simple layout. It was built to very low technological specifications just to see um, how um, basic you could get. Uh, so there's nothing fancy in it, no fancy electronics, uh, point and signal control is all mechanical. Uh, buildings are scratch built for the most part to own designs but based on loosely S&D practice um, of the time. Yeah. Uh, the future of the lab, well it is 14 years old, uh, it's still very much runnable, it still goes out to shows two or three times a year, um, we'll just have to see how long it lasts. Critchell Down is another fictitious layout. It occupies a space of only 8 by 1 feet, but is crammed full of scenic details. Martin Goodall is the present owner. This is Critchell Down. Uh, it's 25 years old as a layout. It started as a double-O layout with Pico Streamline Track, built uh, uh, double-O gauge, uh, very crude. Um, and um, I decided about uh, 1982 to convert it to P4 and uh, the only way of doing that was to actually reproduce the geometry of the Pico streamline points, two foot radius curves and everything, one in four uh, angles uh, in P4 which I think hadn't been done by anybody else at that time. I think most people were rather horrified at the very idea. And it worked. Um, admittedly, there are a few more um, check rails than you would find in the prototype, just to make sure things don't fall off. Um, you find it this weekend not working that smoothly because um, we've got high humidity and we've got dirt as a result. And despite cleaning the track, cleaning the wheels, we're having problems. But normally, it runs quite smoothly. And it's proved to be uh, you know, a very successful layout. It's been good fun. It's very accurate, absolutely down to the last rivet. No, actually, it's completely fictitious based on the general light railway idea, but it's not based on any, any particular pressure type. Uh, it, it's not even really just, it's not even Colonel Stevens, it's just any, any uh, sort of uh, light railway, combination of light railways. Uh, there's a tram trailer on the layout which was inspired by the trailers which worked on the Wantage Tramway. Uh, there's a tram engine which was uh, on the Wisbeach and Upwell Tramway uh, in um, uh, Cambridgeshire. Uh, there is a traction engine, uh, which always causes great amusement, uh, which is based on one which worked in the North Kent cement works. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the rolling stock comes from a variety of different sources, uh, and in fact there's a certain amount of freelancing involved, uh, and some people who are very keen on scale accuracy might look askance at it. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a fun layout as far as I'm concerned, 
Um, scale accuracy is frankly not important to me. I'm just interested in making a, a, a picture. It's a caricature, really. Let's take a break from our tour of the layouts and look at the show's other attractions. The large demonstration area, always a popular feature at Scale Forum, again attracted a great deal of interest. Subjects covered this year ranged from coach and locomotive construction to road vehicles and scenic building with experts offering practical advice to all. The trade stands offered a wide selection of model railway items, from books and magazines to locomotives, rolling stock and road vehicles. A large range of tools, paints and a thousand and one other items required to construct a model railway were also on sale plenty to tempt both the novice and experienced modeler alike. Returning to our tour, we find ourselves in the Suffolk countryside at Somersham Station, which is set in the 1950s. It was built by Peter Runnicles, who now takes up the story. Um, now, Somersham is a, a village to the northwest of Ipswich, about three or four miles to the northwest of Ipswich. And there was a scheme projected in the late 1800s to link Felixstowe with the Midland Railway. Um, the Midland Railway promoted the, uh, the scheme. Uh, in practice it never came to anything, but my layout is based on the supposition that at least part of the line was built. Um, being fairly isolated from the main Midland system um, was taken over at a reasonably early stage by the Great Eastern Railway, who then ran it as a branch line from the nearby London to Norwich main line. The layout itself has been, has been built as a first attempt at P4 modelling. Um, so it's been very much a learning exercise on my part in terms of getting to, to grips with P4 track and wheel standards, uh, locomotive construction, rolling stock construction, as well as, as all the other thousand and one other things you have to do when you're building a layout like the, um, the electrics, the scenery and the buildings and so on. So there's been quite a lot to, to learn in a reasonably short space of time. The reason I went for a fairly small layout to start with was so that I had a, a fighting chance of getting it completed in um, this particular lifetime, rather than trying to take on a, a very ambitious project, um, which would sort of see me out and never really get finished. I think my interests are, are, are fairly general. Um, they've been in, enjoyable and less enjoyable aspects of, of building all parts of the layout. Um, and I, I think in particular I enjoy putting buildings together. Um, the buildings on the layout are a mixture of um, proprietary kits, modified kits and scratch built. So I've, I've tried to, to get a, a fairly good mix there if I can. There's still a lot of work to do on the layout to add more of the details. Um, things like signalling, point rodding, telegraph poles uh, and some of the finer detailing on the scenic still need to be completed. Uh, as well as building some, some of those unmade kits which I'm sure all of us have tucked away at home, so I won't be short of things to do for the next few years. From a fictitious layout, we moved to one based on an actual location. Chiseldon was built by David Barrett, who now gives an insight into the station's history. 
The Midland South Western Junction Railway ran from Andover down to Andoversford, and the model is of the station is Chiseldon, which is just to the south of Swindon. The line formed a link between West Midlands and basically Southampton docks, mostly called into use during the wartime or military manoeuvres. I based the model at around the 1920s, if only because there aren't enough kits available for the Midland South Western. So I have to use quite a few Great Western vehicles for the time being, and I'm gradually trying to modify it up. All of the buildings that are shown on the layout exist in Chiseldon. I've shuffled the arrangements around a little bit to suit the, the model rather than the actual situation. And I'm told by people who live there it's reasonably accurate. Hopefully anybody who looks at it will agree. They operated quite a lot of through trains from the Midlands, hence the use of London North Western carriages, Midland carriages. They also borrowed from the Midland South Western, the Midland South Western borrowed from the Midland, the London South Western. There's even reports of Great Eastern stock running through. So I can build pretty well whatever I like. Ran through to, it was closed in 1959. I know this because I was at school in Sirencester, backing onto the railway line and we could sit there taking the train numbers from the first form class classrooms. And that's how I got interested in the area. It's the shortest station on the line, but I've modelled it about 75% of scale length. And it just happens to fit into a four-foot board, which saves getting joints. The pub is original, it's still there. Uh, I'm not over-impressed with the beer. But, uh, it's now been painted white, as in fact most of the, the cottages have, with the exception of the, the farthest one, which is in the, the one that's in the wrong position, which actually was built before 1800 as the poorhouse. And apparently somebody's got the drawings for that in the, from the local museum, and it's about right as well. Which explains it's got a very unusual configuration in it. But, so perhaps that explains it. Oh, it didn't look right as a row of cottages, but it's turned out okay at the end. It's a future battle. I might finish the landscaping one day, uh, but there are. Uh, I, I thought about extending it out to the sort of end of the station limits to where it becomes single track, but the modelling potential is fairly limited as just cuttings and so on like that. So I, I suspect it won't get extended. It's, it's difficult enough to store it at home as it is. So it'll, it'll probably not stay for that, stay for much longer. I should concentrate on trying to produce the, the correct Middle and South Western stock that run, runs on the layout and go from there. Now there's some transfers for the engines, which helps, courtesy of Pendon. And we'll just carry on developing like that until probably I get bored with it, <laughs> at which point it will be uh, disposed of. I'll just start another project of some other description. Shown at Scale Forum as a layout under construction, Clarendon is the latest creation of the Lemington and Warwick Model Railway Society. Society member Steve Lee explains the history behind this layout and future plans for its completion. And we're here today with uh, our new layout, uh, Clarendon. Um, we're part of the fine scale group of the uh, Leamington and Warwick Club. Um, and we've got an existing layout called uh, Walford Town, which is actually EM. Um, which has sort of done the exhibition circuit, um, so we decided we wanted to build something to uh, replace Walford um, and to move up to P4. Um, but unfortunately, we've all got different railway interests, and it was very difficult to find a station that we all wanted to model. Uh, so we hit upon uh, Addison Road in West London, which had uh, uh, a lot of uh, different uh, trains from different companies the Great Western, uh, the NNWR, the LBSC, London South Western. Uh, so it seemed an ideal prototype from that point of view. Um, unfortunately, it was a very big station, um, and there's no way we could model it within the club room, um, let alone pay for a layout of that sort of size. Um, so we decided to invent our, um, our own station in the same area of West London. Um, and that's how uh, Clarendon was born, as a, um, a terminus uh, of a line off the West London line on which Addison Road station is. Um, and uh, having created uh, this new terminus, um, it was fair to assume that uh, it would handle the same sort of interchange tra uh, traffic as um, Addison Road does. Um, so that's the, uh, the background, as it were. Um, we've got the layout um, here today um, being exhibited for the first time um, in an incomplete state. Uh, it's been a good, uh, good trial for us actually to, uh, to have it out and run it, um, try out the stock for the first time. 
uh, and actually there's been a lot of interest from, uh, from visitors here, a lot of questions asked, and we've actually uh, picked up invitations to four exhibitions, so uh, we're, we're quite pleased. The period is uh, about 1908, um, i.e. pre-grouping. Um, one of the reasons for choosing that period was that um, I was already uh, modelling in, uh, in P4, um, that sort of period, so I, I had quite a bit of stock which could run on Carindon anyway, so it seemed to be a, you know, a good starting point. So yes, there are about a dozen of us involved um, with the layout, um, both uh, building the stock and working on the layout itself. Um, and we've organised ourselves so that different people are responsible for different parts, um, like I'm in charge of uh, rolling stock, though that doesn't mean I have to build it all myself, but deciding you know, what needs to be built and who's going to build it. And then similarly we've got somebody else who's in charge of tracks, somebody else who's in charge of scenery, so uh, we try to organise ourselves. Moving east again we come to Falfen Slade. Set in the 1930s and inspired by the Great Eastern, it is the terminus of a single line branch. Adrian Dyer, chairman of the Saffron Walden Model Railway Club, explains the layout's background and its operational strategy. Fulfen Slade, the name is derived from the River Fulfen, which runs through Saffron Walden um, and enters into the camp. Um, it's quite a, a, a well-known local name. Um, it was appropriate for a, a, a layout built by the club. Uh, it's a fictitious layout. Um, the certain influences of architecture of the uh, area. Uh, the buildings are based uh, on the uh, line from Bishop Stortford to Dunmo. Um, particularly on the buildings at Rain, uh, which are largely preserved. The Good Shed, Good Shed for example, is from Rain. Um, the uh, station building is also from Rain. Other buildings, including the engine shed, are based on those at Saffron Walden. Um, the track plan is entirely fictitious, um, but there is certain influence from uh, Mildenhall branch. Uh, the layout operates at the end of the 1930s, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, around 1936-1937. Um, all LNER locomotives, teak coaches and appropriate good stock. Um, almost all of the stock, including the locomotives, wagons and coaches, with a couple of exceptions, are either kit built or scratch built, as are all the buildings, um, and very little ready to run uh, at all or uh, ready made items of uh, scenery. Um, we operate the layout um, on a, a fairly uh, lax principle of uh, um, selecting goods trains. We do this with a card system um, and uh, we just pick at random a selection of wagons from the layout um, which we then have to collect together from the layout into a train and it's quite a, an interesting little uh, exercise in shunting to be able to do that which usually goes wrong and then allegedly at 15 minute intervals we run passenger trains um, but if the shunt goes wrong it's more like half an hour to three quarters of an hour and that's how we operate uh, Fulfen Slide. Nearing the end of our journey we arrive at Lower Pandy, a standard gauge industrial line. Wakefield Model Railway Society member Paul Gittins explains the fascinating history behind the layout. And Lower Pandy is uh, the latest to say creation in the Cairo Valley scheme of things that started in the late 70s with a double O layout and has developed into uh, the P4 masterpiece that you see in front of you. Lower Pandy is an actual place in the Glen Valley. What, what's happened, the, uh, so the Cambrian and the Shops Union Canal um, in the late, late 1800s uh, put forward a scheme for a standard gauge line up the valley to tap the mineral resources and the uh, Great Western didn't like it because it a, didn't want the Cambrian on its territory and b it certainly didn't want the North Western through its connection with the Shops Union encroaching so they uh, re you know really put the mockers on it and uh, in the end they, they built the, the narrow gauge Glen Valley tramway that we know today but there was an act of parliament passed and I think it was 1863 which did allow for the building of a standard gauge line from uh, Ellesmere across country through St Martin's, Western Rin, on up to Glen Cairog. and all my layouts in recent years at least have had this sort of theme to them that is somewhere on that line and now we're on the, the mineral extension which stretched up the valley to the quarries and the slate and china stone and uh, granite and all sorts of things up there so flannel mills and bitumen plants all of which were there in actual 
um, in the actual narrow gauge days, uh, which are promulgated, carried on into the standard gauge days. So, plenty of excuse for traffic. I, I try to get two levels on the layout to add a bit of interest and to sort of tear it upwards a bit so that the, the locos and stock at the back can still be seen as well as the ones at the front and having a few climbs and uh, inclines I think that adds a bit of interest and people are amazed sometimes when they see that locos will go up uh, sort of one in one and a half climbs so probably not that steep really, but one in 15 I think but uh, it works and operates you know. the centre board is five foot six long uh, which a, it fits into a, just fits into an estate car, and, and B, it was the only size of board I could get which the track plan would fit. I, I spent many happy hours with a roll of lining paper and point templates to make sure everything fitted in. But again, what that does mean, that all the point operating units, the track feeds, all hit the, on the one board, and there's nothing going across apart from a couple of jumpers just to continue electrical. Um, the centre board says five foot six, the two outer boards are, hang on, two foot nine is it? Half of five foot six. And they're hinged and fold over and meet in the middle so the whole unit just gets lifted up and put straight in the back of the car. Very, very neat. We complete our tour of Scale Forum at Lambourne, set in the summer of 1938. Ian Watson is our guide to this busy country branch line voted by the public best layout at the show and therefore winners of the Ken York Trophy. The layout was originally built, or it was built in 1990. It's been out and about for eight years. Um, and it was really started because I'd, I'd been out of railway modelling for some time. Um, I moved into a smaller house, um, curtailment of what I was doing, mod model engineering, large size steam models. Um, and the small house set back in, we got a spare bedroom and Lambourne was built sort of a baseboard at a time in the spare bedroom and sort of hit the exhibition circuit early 1990. Lam the railway line to Lambourne was first sort of suggested I think back in 1870 because Lambourne was a very isolated town but various schemes sort of came and went and it wasn't until 1898 that the first train eventually reached Lambourne and that was operated by the Lambourne Valley Light Railway Company. They had to hire a loco from the Great Western for the first few months. They had their own coaches and wagons and eventually had three locos of their own. But by 1905 the company was in usual financial troubles and the Great Western took over. Um, the, the branch really stayed much as it was apart from the station at Lambourne which was completely rebuilt uh, with a standard Great Western brick-built station building. The only two buildings that remained were the small wooden goods shed and the engine shed. And then in 1938, the Great Western introduced a diesel rail car service. And it was the first of the Great Western diesel rail cars to have buffers and couplings on it. The idea being that it could pull horse boxes, which were a major feature of the branch traffic at Lambourne. And once the diesel was introduced, the engine shed was demolished um, and the little wooden goods shed actually did survive until 1960 when the branch closed. Very early beach enclosure and there's sadly nothing left today at Lambourne. Uh, we went there earlier this year to commemorate the centenary of the branch. We were there actually over the same weekend, first weekend of April, uh, in the little village hall at Lambourne with the layout set up lots of local people with their memories, their photographs and drawings and a super two days we had there as well. And so Scale Forum 98 comes to a close, an enjoyable two days for both visitor and exhibitor alike. Arrangements are well advanced for next year's show and the Society is planning to see out the century in style. So make a date to join them at the Leatherhead Leisure Centre on the 25th and 26th of September for Scale Forum 99, the finest model railway exhibition of the year. <laughs>